Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. If someone on the street were crying out for help because their furious partner were chasing them, would you step in and help? Would you rush away in fear for your own safety? Would you call the police? Would you do anything? Thinking in these types of ways about ourselves shines a light on our goodness or lack thereof as human beings. Most of us would do absolutely nothing in that situation, feeling hopeful that the person running will have a stroke of good luck and get out of that bad situation. In time, we forget that it ever happened. Are there times in your life you should have done something and didn't? I have several moments, and it is not pleasant to remember them. Maybe you can recall more times that you did act than did not. That said, just because we don't act in situations like the one I described does not mean we are cruel, lying, horrible people either. In short, we are a mixed bag. But we're probably not as good as we'd like to believe. This difference between how we view ourselves and how we actually are is the subject of the new book, The Character Gap, How Good Are We? by Dr. Christian Miller, the A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University. Based on the research found in hundreds of psychological studies and dissected through the lens of moral philosophy, the character gap is an interesting way to get all of us to think a little more clearly about what it means to be a good person. No matter what age you are, you can do better. This book has gotten me to be a little more honest about a few issues I'm having in my own life, and maybe it can help you as well. If you like this show, please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. You can find me on Twitter at classical underscore ideas, on Facebook at facebook.com slash classical ideas podcast, or you can even financially support the show at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. If you want to follow Dr. Christian Miller, you can find him online at twitter.com slash character gap. You can find the character gap, How Good Are We?, out now from Oxford University Press. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Christian Miller. Dr. Christian Miller, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. It's great to be with you today. Can you just spend a moment and introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit? Well, my name is Christian Miller. I'm a professor here at Wake Forest University, which is in North Carolina. I've been a professor of philosophy for the last 14 years. Uh, in, in addition to uh, teaching and, and researching in the area of philosophy, I'm also married uh, with three small kids. So that actually is an opportunity for me to think about character in a very practical way. Maybe we'll get into that a little later. Uh, I was born in uh, Maryland, but grew up mainly in Florida. Went off to school in New Jersey at Princeton and then graduate school at Notre Dame before I was hired here at Wake Forest. And I've been there ever since. Awesome. Okay. So I'm curious about people's backstories, just a tad to set some context. Why did you want to become a philosophy professor? Like, how did you get interested in the world of ideas? Sure. Uh, so most people are not exposed to philosophy, maybe until they get to college. Uh, I, I was an unusual case. So my first exposure happened early in high school. And it was through reading a philosopher slash theologian named C.S. Lewis. Mm. Uh, I came across some of his books. They were recommended to me. And I just kind of fell in love with the ideas that were being uh, debated in his work. So ideas about the existence of God, the nature of morality, the afterlife, the nature of the self, uh, how do we make sense of suffering in the world? And, and that just kind of set me on a path of reading lots of his work and then reading people who influenced him and then reading contemporary people who were influenced by him. And then that, so that kind of got me, me thinking in that world. But then there was another kind of discrete moment in high school, which furthered me on the path of philosophy. And that was senior year where I ran out of courses to take at my high school. Hmm. So I went over to a, a local college and I thought, well, you know, 
uh, I never had a chance to formally study philosophy before, but now here's my chance. So I took an introduction to philosophy class with a professor named Dr. Bible, uh, liter wow. literally, literally Dr. Bible. And uh, he taught me introduction to philosophy, and I loved it so much that I ended up taking philosophy of religion and philosophy of science with him all my senior year. And so, you know, very unusual situation when I was going off to college, already having a lot of background in philosophy. And frankly, uh, you know, uh, I pretty much knew what I was going to do with, with the rest of my life. Was Bible spelled like the actual Bible? Yeah, B-I-B-L-E. Oh, my goodness. That is just <laughs> so fortuitous and fantastic. Right. <laughs> um, so your main area of interest as a professor is simply the concept of character. And when I say simply, I don't mean to, um, you know, break it down that's that that wildly but it is you know a word that people may think about every now and then but they don't really uh consider the complexity and the depth of what it means so as a professor who studies character what do you mean by that term sure and as a philosopher i like to always start by getting clear on what we're talking about it's what i begin every class with like definitions and clarity so the term character is a little bit old fashioned these days. You don't hear it as much anymore. And uh, it also can mean different things. So sometimes when I'm talking about character, people think I'm talking about novels and plays and characters and <laughs> plays and this kind of thing. And then we're talking right past each other and it's very confusing. But that's not what I mean at all. I mean moral character. And by that, I mean the kind of moral fiber that's internal to us. It's how we're disposed to think feel and act when it comes to moral matters. That's the, that's the philosophy uh, definition. Let me try to make it a little bit more concrete and, and applicable. So a person of good moral character is someone who's virtuous, has the virtues. Someone, for example, who's honest. So let's try and unpack it that way. Uh, an honest person, that's part of their character, having the trait of honesty, and that leads them to think in honest ways, so they think that the truth is important. They feel in honest ways, or be motivated in honest ways, so they, they are concerned about the truth, and then subsequently behave in an honest way, so they tell the truth, they don't lie, cheat, steal, etc. So that's a way in which someone's character would be manifested, not just in their outward behavior, but also in their underlying motivation and thinking about the world. So with that said, we can take that concept of moral character and break it down into two main categories. We have the moral virtues, things like honesty, compassion, justice, courage, and the like. And we have the flip side, the moral vices, things like, and you can just, just reverse each virtue, things like dishonesty or cowardice or cruelty uh, or injustice. And with those two kind of categories to work with, we can think about are people more virtuous in their character? Or are they more vicious in their character? And you can also think about their behavior. Did someone act honestly or did someone act dishonestly in a given instance? So that's how I'm approaching the concept of character. Is there a backstory to why you specifically care about this topic? Like, did you have an existential crisis as a young man? Like, what's, how, did you, how did you come to this topic? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I wish I had some dramatic story I could tell you about this <laughs> week, you know, Dark Night of the Soul or something that I went through. Uh, but I, I have to say, I don't uh, have that kind of dramatic story. It's more a matter for me of being wrapped up with all the other ideas I think about when it comes to being a philosopher. So, you know, I, I think about what is the meaning of life? I think about, does God exist? I think about the nature of morality. Where does morality come from? I think about how should I live my life? What's right and what's wrong? And so much of that is all wrapped up with the concept of character. So you know, part of what it is to live a flourishing life, Aristotle would have said, is to be a good person, to have good character. And that's, that's, that's what he called eudaimonia, or sometimes called happiness, a happy life. And so that's an idea that's kind of gripped me from, from the very beginning, basically all the way back to high school, that uh, you know, to live a certain kind of life that I want to live, a flourishing life, will involve, require me to have a good character, or at least try to have a good character. And then I need to think about, well, what does character mean? And what are the standards for, of character? And how am I falling short of having a good character so that I can kind of continue on that path to being the kind of person I want to be? 
Excellent. Well, you break all this down in a brand new book that just came out. It's called The Character Gap, How Good Are We? And it's out now from Oxford University Press. And as I was telling you in email yesterday, this is a book that is so accessible. I feel like I could successfully teach this book in a high school classroom, a graduate school classroom, a doctoral classroom. I feel like I could do it as a book club with just friends in the neighborhood. So you really achieve something special here with regards to accessibility, because that is not an easy feat. Um, And I also was reading, and I started reading it about a week ago, and I laughed out loud on page one, because you start a book on human character with Black Friday, which I absolutely loved. So can you tell us a little bit about your epiphany of Black Friday and how you, as a philosophy professor who studies character, has observed this bizarre cultural phenomenon like over the years? Right. Sure. Sure. Uh, so let me s- start with the accessibility real briefly. Sure. Uh, so I've been working as a professional philosopher for, as I said, 14 years. And in our profession, we tend to write very kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say obscure, but at least we, in a way that's not very accessible for a larger audience. We write in our professional journals, we write books, but they're filled with technical j- jargon and terminology. So I- I've done that for a long time. And I just thought to myself, boy, I didn't really want to spend the rest of my life just writing in that way. I, I was hoping to take these really important ideas about character and see if I could you know, disseminate them for a larger audience, to get them out there, because I think they're so important and so many people care about them. So that's, that's the goal of this book, The Character Gap. I mean, uh, I commend you for that effort. That is just wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, so it's a trade book. It's not a, an academic book, and it's really written with a non-academic audience in mind. So I, you're right, absolutely. I start with this idea of, uh, and this example having to do with Black Friday, I use it as a kind of way to grab the reader's attention that this is a topic that really matters and that there's a lot of uh, gravitas or seriousness associated with it. But let me give the the backstory first. So the the, uh, book begins with this real life case of Walter Vance, who's a uh, shop owner in a small town in West Virginia, who wants to have some new decorations for Christmas for his shop. So he goes to a local Target. Uh, he's 61 years old. He's had some health problems and, and heart trouble. Uh, he's shopping in the aisles, and then his, his heart gives out. He has a heart attack, and he collapses to the ground. Well, you can uh, you know, ask yourself, what would you do? If that, if that was not you at Walter Vance, but you a shopper at Target on Black Friday looking for your own you know, purchases, but you see someone collapse to the ground. For those listeners who are not familiar with Black Friday, I've, I've actually had to explain this sometimes, uh, especially outside of a U.S. context. This is the day where, after Thanksgiving, the the stores are overrun because there are massive sales, and so it, you can see uh, you can get great deals, but you have to fight lots of crowds who are kind of pushing and shoving sometimes to get the same products that you want to get. So Walter Vance is lying on the ground, motionless. What would you do? Well, I mean, I think most people would say oh, I would do something. I would call nine one one. I would run over and check on him. I would get the manager of the store, whatever. But in this, again, real case, nothing happened. Mm. Uh, Nothing happened, at least as far as Walter Vance was concerned. The shopping continued. People, you know, saw his body. Some of them would turn around and go in the other direction. Some of them would just continue what they were doing, looking at the, the aisles. In a few cases, people would actually step over his body to get to that, that TV or whatever it was that they really wanted uh, further down the aisle, <laughs> and it was, anyway, so it just seems absurd. But it's uh, it's this is not so surprising if you look at the psychological research. Anyway, uh, to wrap up the story, he uh, eventually some nurses come along. They see his body. They call for an ambulance. The ambulance comes, and uh, unfortunately, he dies on the way to the hospital. We don't know for sure whether he would have survived if the first person who had seen him pass out had called for nine one one. We don't know, but certainly would have been a better chance. Um, and this is, you know, a, a partially reflection of Black Friday, but it's also partially a reflection of our character when it comes to group context. And that's, you know, what I really want to highlight. You know, the Black Friday is important, too, because it's a situation which can peel away some of our uh, kind of ordinary day-to-day social veneer and reveal some of the uglier sides to our character. You know, some of that kind of uh, crass materialism and, and just kind of self-centeredness. That's important, but the real importance I take for this story to have is that uh, in group situations, 
when emergencies happen, oftentimes there won't be someone rushing to help if no one else is doing anything. Mm. This is a bystander effect or the group effect. Uh, again, uh, we tend to kind of blend in with the crowd or uh, you know, just hold back or hang back out of fear of embarrassment or out of diffusion of responsibility or other things like that, rather than rushing in and helping someone who's obviously in need. And this is, you know, uh, I think a uh, an affor- really unfortunate illustration of lack of virtue, the way in which our character needs some, uh, you know, significant improvements. So our basic view of character is that we would all like to believe that we would do something. So is that the basic view of character that people tend to have about themselves and others? That, as far as that situation is concerned, yes. And and then more generally, uh, that we, we tend to think of ourselves as helping, as helpful, as compassionate. And then you, you kind of generalize beyond just helping to the other areas of morality. We tend to think of ourselves as, as honest, as uh, you know, as uh, temperate, as self-controlled, as uh, as as gracious, as having a lot of gratitude and so forth, so that you sum all those up, we tend to think of ourselves as good people, as people of good character. And this is not just, you know, uh, anecdotal, uh, m- me talking to people and what they say. It's when you actually look at the surveys that have been administered on a larger scale to thousands of participants, and you ask people, you know, rate your character or rate yourself on honesty or rate yourself on compassion on a one to five scale with with five being very good. People will tend to put themselves in the, in the kind of neighborhood of four out of five. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on the higher end. But where are we really? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's a hard matter to discern. I, I have my my view, which I outline, uh, but it's, you know, just to set it up. Uh, it's not just, it can't just be a matter of what we think our character is like, uh, that, that can't be at the end of the story. It might be the beginning of the story, but it's not the end of the story because, uh, we might not have full self knowledge about our own character. There might be aspects of our character we don't even realize are there, or we might deceive ourselves and pretend like some things are not going on, which are really going on. So the short answer uh, to the question is. I think our character is very much a mixed bag. Mm. It's, we have what I call a mixed character. We have some good sides to our character, but at the same time, we have some bad sides to our character. So we're, our character is not good enough to count as virtuous, but it's also not bad enough to count as vicious. And the way I come to that conclusion, and you can you can come to that conclusion in a variety of ways. There's not there's not one uh, you know, source of information about this. You can look at human history. You can look at the teachings of different religions. You can look at kind of world events and current events today. But my preferred method to study people's actual, actual character is to look at psychological research, to look at studies where people were put into different situations, and then we see how they actually behave. Mm-hmm. Not, not how they think they would behave, because that's not always accurate. It's what did they really do when they were put in a situation where they had a chance to, to cheat or a chance to lie, or a chance to steal or to help someone or to harm someone. And looking at uh, about you know several hundred, several hundred of these studies over the years, uh, going back to the 1950s really is when the, the research got rolling in psychology. I kinda, so I'm looking at a whole bunch of these studies in an aggregate, I came to this kind of general conclusion that our character is this mixed bag. And I'm happy to, to dive into any particular studies if you like, but that's the, the kind of uh, summary conclusion I've arrived at. Okay. So I was reading this book and I couldn't help but start thinking about how we all tend to do good things sometimes and our intentions are sometimes good and our intentions are sometimes less than respectable. So an example that I have is like, you know, we all live in this like selfie culture where everybody's online all the time and we film ourselves helping people and then we post it on Facebook. And I've seen so many examples of this, like on my own social media, where people that I'm friends with on social media will give people something film themselves doing it, make a big show of it, and then get like 150 likes or hearts on Facebook and Twitter. (laughs) Right, right. You know, and I can't help but wonder how the people who are receiving these items feel about having their lives and what they lack put online. And so like, I'm curious about if you can break this down for the listener about the possibly 
admirable action and how this admirable action misses the mark of actually being virtuous. Right. Good. Good. Yep. So there are, I think, different combinations we should pay attention to. There's, when I say combinations, combinations of motivation together with action. So character, as I said at the beginning, is not just a matter of action. It's also a matter of underlying thinking and feeling, your, your motivation and your thoughts. And those can come apart. So what ideally you want is really good behavior that arises from virtuous motivation. And what you really don't want is bad behavior that arises from vicious motivation. Mm. But what you're giving us is a case in the middle, a case where you've got admirable behavior, but kind of crummy motivation. Sure. So what, so what, you know, how, how would you think about that? Uh, I think, you know, on the one hand, we should be positive about it because, hey, it's better than not helping at all. You know, the, you know so uh, if there's a lot of charity donation that happens, but it happens for crummy motivation, you might say, well, at least it's charity donation. At least people are being helped with those, by those charities. And, you know, better that than just the money being spent on some, uh, you know, trivial luxury item. On the other hand... Motivation matters too to character. So let's. Uh, here's an example that philosophers use to make the same point. That your your example is really good too. This is a famous example from the philosopher Michael Stocker, uh, and it goes like this: You're in the hospital. Uh, you've been in the hospital for days. You're you're kind of lonely. No one's come to visit you. Then here's a knock on the door. In comes your best friend, or so you thought it was your best friend. And you're so glad to see your best friend. You say, hey, th thank you so much for visiting me. I, I, I missed you and I missed uh, seeing anyone. And your best friend says, in a moment of kind of brutal honesty, well, he, you know, yes, I'm, I'm here. But, you know, if I'm being honest, I was just bored and there was nothing else. I had, uh, you know, mm -hmm. nothing better to do with my time. Or your friend says, uh, well, I, I'm here, but only because I thought I would feel guilty if I didn't come to visit you. Or I'm here... But um, this is just part of my kind of obligatory uh, volunteering work that I needed to do to get my credit for my for my service activity. Hmm. Well, you know, these are di three different I illustrations of self-interested motivation, where the motivation is focused on the individual and not on the person in need. And so if I was that person in the hospital, I would say, oh, you know, glad you're here. But boy, that's not the right kind of motivation. <laughs> I wish I wish I wish you were here for because you care about me, because you're my friend, because you love me, because you wanted to keep me company, period. And not because it came back to you and uh, what was in your self interest. Yeah. You know, and so if you come to if you're the friend and you want to go there, you like want to get accolades like you're like oh you you're so such a good person for coming to visit me and like you're doing it for all the wrong reasons so like this reminds me of an example of like when i would talk to my some of my students in class and sometimes in my with my seniors in my religious studies and philosophy class that i would teach is i would you know if i would come in and i would talk about how if i came into the first day of school telling myself this is the year i'm going to be teacher of the year you know mm -hmm, right. i i am coming in saying this is what I deserve this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that will cause me to become possibly like the worst version <laughs> of my teacher self because I will be inwardly focused instead of outwardly focused towards the students. But it's rational to want to be teacher of the year. Right. You right. know, because you right. get an award, you get a, a check. Right. So one of the things I want to know is how should young professionals like reconcile this desire to be praised for their hard work while also not craving these sort of like top of the mountains accolades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and I, I would probably broaden it out, you know, more than just professionals to, you know, like we said, volunteering uh, and helping people and just kind of all the, the same issue arises in lots of different contexts. So uh, that's a really challenging question and a really good one. I, I think of it this way, and I hope this is helpful. Uh, I want to distinguish between a goal and a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And to get at the distinction, I'm going to talk about uh, driving a car. So this might seem like I've, I've gone off on a big tangent, and what, what, was, what does this have to do with anything? But just bear with me. Sure. Uh, so when we're driving a car, 
uh, we're, we have a goal in mind, which is getting to the location, getting to the destination. And then a, a byproduct of that, or a side effect, if you want to use that language instead, is that exhaust comes out of the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it would be really strange if someone was driving their car with the goal in mind of emitting, emitting exhaust. There would be some kind of weird polluter who would just want to you know, have that as their goal. That's not, that's not what we normally do. We have a goal in mind, getting to the destination, but then we also know that in order to get to our destination, there are going to be some byproducts or side effects like exhaust. Well, take that analogy and bring it back to motivation. When I visit my friend in the hospital, let's change the example. So now I'm the visitor. Mm-hmm. I'm coming to visit my friend. I can visit my friend with the goal in mind of just wanting to spend time with my friend or because I care about my friend. And as a byproduct of that, I might feel good afterwards. Uh, or I you know, might avoid feeling guilty. Uh, but that in doing that, my focus is in the right place. It's selfless. It's, uh, it's what philosophers would say is altruistic as opposed to egoistic. Even though some benefits might accrue to me, some benefits might uh, come along for the ride for me, they're not what I have in mind. They're side effects. And the same thing could then generalize to your, say, your teacher example. Uh, if you come in the first day with the goal in mind of being the teacher of the year, that's probably not going to work out so well. But uh, you know, you, you said you care about your students, you work really hard for them, you're focused on them. And then as a byproduct of that, you might win teacher of the year, which is something you want. Uh, but that can't be the goal initially, or it's, you're going fail to being, fail at being a virtuous teacher. All right. Yeah. And, and that makes tons of sense because, you know, if you're obsessed about being teacher of the year, you're going to be, you know, selfish in your behavior and you're constantly going to be telling people, look how great I am. Right. And that's not going to win you any allies. Right. Um, so you also mentioned that vicious people often wind up doing things that are very good for other people in society. Can you give a couple of examples of that? Because yeah. like, you know, you talk about virtuous people doing good things for society with selfless and altruistic motivations. But what about the vicious people who do things that actually wind up helping? What are we to think about that? Yeah. So it, it would be nice if it was really elegant. So the virtuous person does these great things and for virtuous motivation. And then the vicious person always does terrible things and for vicious motivation. So it's it kind of that nice symmetry in how things work. But it's more complicated than that. Why? Because vicious people are often clever as well. And they realize that if, okay, if I do hateful things I'm, or if I cheat, you know, in front of others, I'm going to get in trouble. I might get fired from my job or I might get arrested by the police. So I don't want any of that to happen. So I have to be more subtle in my, my vicious behavior. And so what ends up happening is that there is a split in their lives between their kind of outward presentation and their inward life or their private life. Mm. Uh, so you're, you're, you're all about classic ideas. This is an idea that Plato had all the way back in the Republic uh, when he was talking, uh, Socrates was talking about the idea of whether the best life is a life of public virtue and private vice. Uh, so the, the idea is that, you know, when you're around others, you act like you're a really great person and you get all the uh, uh, acclaim and recognition and so forth. And then in your private life, when you can get away with it, you can lie, cheat and steal and so forth. So that's the, the kind of background context. Now, actual examples, uh, I'm reticent to use, you know, real life examples mm-hmm. so that I don't get myself in trouble of accusing someone of being uh, vicious. That's a really great point. I didn't even yeah. think about that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I mean, there are historical examples. Uh, you know, we can, we, we can all agree that Hitler and, and Stalin and so forth are vicious. Uh, I, here, let me do a, go to a little bit different route with a, 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 a movie example. So one movie I show to my students every semester in Introduction to Philosophy is Crimes and Misdemeanors by Woody Allen. And not many people have probably seen it, so I can summarize it real quickly with the main ideas. In that movie, the main character, the movie opens with the main character getting an award for his, his uh, great research in medicine. So here he's, he's being celebrated by the community. And then as the movie unfolds, we find that actually he lives a double life. In his private life, he's uh, cheating on his wife, and he's embezzling money, and so forth. But he's getting away with it. He's not getting caught, 
and then I won't say the end, but uh, you know, the, uh, the 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 movie raises the question: Is he living the best life of all as the as the vicious person living this double life? So there's an example of someone who outwardly getting recognition from society, but inwardly, when he gets away with it, is doing these vicious things. Okay, so in the book, you have these like examples of these superhuman people that live these totally virtuous lives and they are completely altruistic in their motivations. And so this to me is so insanely hard because, you know, we're all living in the same world right now for the most part in the, in the U.S. or wherever you're listening to this, where it, you have astronomical health insurance costs, car payments, student loan debts, endless wars in the world, skyrocketing home and rent prices, job insecurity. And part of me was completely exhausted reading these, <laughs> re, like reading the book because I was like, oh my gosh, I have all this stuff to worry about and it feels like I have to be superhuman to actually live a virtuous life. Is our society right now sort of like designed to not give us the time and space to reach full virtuousness? Yeah, there's a lot, lot of great issues packed in there. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm sorry that you were exhausted. Uh, no, 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 no. Was, no. That, that I, was I my intention. Yeah. I, 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 you know, uh, I, did, I don't want to, uh, the the book to have that impact on people. Um, you know, I, I want the book to inspire people yes. and not discourage. And that, that, but that's a real danger when you when you work on the topic of of character and virtue. Uh, it can be a, a source of discouragement rather than inspiration. Uh, my my first point I think I would make is virtue comes in degrees. So it's not like an all or nothing. Either you're honest or you're not. And it's like an on-off switch. Sure. Uh, so it's really important to remember that it, it comes in degrees. So you know, what, what I'm striving for in my personal life is to become first you know, somewhat virtuous. And if I can be somewhat virtuous, then mo- a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more incrementally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for full virtue, I think, is is unattainable in this life, at least. If we get we can bring in a larger religious discussion, and that that changes it. But uh, you know, I don't think there's been any you know purely human being uh, who has ever achieved full virtue. Even the exemplars I give in the book, like Abraham Lincoln and so forth, they had serious character flaws. So with that, that to my, my mind makes it a little bit more. Um, you know, attainable and a little bit more realistic and a little bit more inspirational. Now, having said that, uh, there's what we can do on our own individually, and then there's what our society kind of helps or hinders us from doing. And you're quite right to say that societal conditions, and this is something Plato and Aristotle were the, you know, were the, some of the first to notice going all the way back to the beginning of Western philosophy, societal conditions make a big difference, uh, that they can kind of either facilitate virtue or put up obstacles to virtue. So, I mean, we could think about different aspects of society on your list and think about how each one of those might be a hindrance to a particular virtue. But I'm, I'm just kind of affirming your general point that, uh, yeah, today there are lots of obstacles or, or hindrances. In the my, my final point, and we can, you know, you can feel free to follow up on any of that. Uh, my final point that comes to mind right now is in the book, uh, The Character Gap, I first talk about what is character. Then I move on to what is our character actually like, how, how good or bad are we, and I say it's mixed. And then in the final section, part three, I propose some strategies for trying to improve. So it's not like I just say, well, <laughs> you know, we've got a mixed character, uh, we, we got some flaws, and see you later, you know, good luck. Uh, I, I say, first of all, character is malleable. It can change. Uh, so we're not stuck with the character we have. And there actually are some good strategies to think about and explore in trying to move the needle, uh, both individually and a, as a community and as a society. So I uh, outline uh, at least three strategies from a secular perspective and then also some ideas from a more religious perspective that would actually well, that would be practical and you know kind of uh, um, usable and not just keeping our heads in the clouds. Excellent. Well, that makes sense why I asked that question then, because I'm only on page 120 in the book. <laughs> um, so I, I'm still working my way towards it, but I'll get there. So It gets better. Yeah, there, there's, a, um, there's a character in the book where your interest and mine intersected, because you write about a man who, speaking of superhuman will of steel, 
um, Dr. Paul Farmer from Partners in Health. And I read this book with a group of high school students when I was a student teacher. And it like fundamentally changed my view of the world, reading about this man's life in the book Mountains Beyond Mountains. Can you tell me about your first reading of this book and how it affected you? Because I love that you and I have both read and have loved that book. Yeah, that's a great, great book. Uh, so let me uh, first explain why I introduced it and what the context is and what I hope to to use it for. Yeah. Uh, so one of the um, strategies I talk about for improving character is is looking to moral exemplars, moral heroes, people who have done a better job than I have in becoming a virtuous person. And what we we see, and we can explore this later if you like, but what we see is that moral exemplars can have a, a significant impact in improving character. Uh, and uh, there's psychological data to back that up. Well, I wanted to not just make that general point, but I wanted to give a concrete illustration and it, uh, several concrete illustrations if I could. And so one, uh, I was kind of casting around looking for, for some good examples, kind of up to date, real world contemporary examples rather than just, you know, distant, distant past, which might not be so relatable today. And it was actually only a few years ago that I came across this book, uh, and I, I didn't know anything about his life, didn't know anything about, you know, uh, embarrassing ignorance on my part, didn't know anything about partners in health. So I, I picked up the book on someone's recommendation and just uh, was engrossed to learn about the impact this one person, Paul Farmer, has had. Starting in about mid-1980s in Haiti with a small team and growing the medical resources in Haiti to the point where millions of people were being treated, impoverished people in particular, were being treated through his health system there, and then how that continued to, to grow and grow. It became international and spread to Africa and South America, became a, a huge organization. That's very impressive in its own right. But there was also the, maybe even more so for me, the human element that was never lost. Because sometimes when... Uh, an organization really takes off, the, the leader can become disengaged from the day-to-day -day life of the organization and become more of a, a figurehead or a fundraiser or uh, you know, a distant leader. But according to the, the book, Paul Farmer, despite all the other things he could be doing, was still incredibly engaged in the day-to-day -day life of the patients he was treating. In one story I uh, summarized in the book, he he walked for seven hours to visit a remote village in Haiti to see if you know a, a couple of families there and how they were doing. Those seven hours he could have used for all kinds of other things, mm -hmm. but he chose to make that hike by himself all the way to that village to check on his patients. That's uh, balancing, you know, impact with humanity and compassion, and that's incredibly uh, inspiring to me. Well, and something else that you wrote about in the book is how when Paul Farmer asks is asked why he's doing what he's doing, he always answers in a way that is selfless. He says, I just love helping people, you know, his, so right. he's got that, he's got that altruistic, uh, um, motivation to it that keeps him as virtuous instead of being the vicious person who does the good things, but then just reaps the benefits from it. That's right. Yeah. So we have to trust his self-report. Um, but I, you know, I have every reason to trust his self-report there and, and you're right. So we, we have the two components, the behavior and the motivation, and both are important for the virtue of compassion in particular is what we're focusing on. Uh, so I think that's why I put him up as an exemplar for that virtue of compassion. Yeah, you know, and this, I think we should talk about something hopeful for a second here, and that's your concept in the book that you outlined that I really liked called Elevation. And this is probably because of the hopeful message uh, and the reminder that examples of great virtue can cause what psychologists call elevation. And mm -hmm. we feel inspired, we feel uplifted, we feel emotional, maybe we, you know, fight back some tears a little bit. <laughs> so, and Paul Farmer makes me feel elevated. And I was just talking to one of my friends yesterday who recently beat cancer, and he wrote a song about beating cancer, and it, I was overwhelmed with emotion. And, you know, I, I cried, I sent him a little message of gratitude that he's alive, and I was elevated by his music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recent feelings or examples in your life of feeling elevated that caused a maybe a sh any shifts in your own virtue lately? Uh, 
Well, I have one that's a little bit, a little bit uh, back in time, and that. So, let me first say a little bit more about elevation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of uh, course. And, and then I'll and I'll, I'll tell you the story. Um, so this is an idea that that psychologists have been exploring uh, just recently. It's it's fairly um, fairly new research where you see someone who you admire. That's the first step. Uh, so say like someone like Paul Farmer, you admire that person, but admiration is not enough. That's the, that's the, the the initial emotion that comes along, but then a second emotion can come along where you feel like uh, I not only admire this person, but I want to be more like this person. So I want to elevate my character, who I am, to better reflect what that other person is like. So that's the second inspirational component, and it there's one uh, there. Th- this has happened to me several times in life. The one that comes to mind right now that I, I actually didn't uh, really give this a lot of thought until you just asked it um, is uh, is my mother who was going through a really terrible uh, uh, health challenge when I was in high school uh, and it, it involved her uh, the, the nerves in her legs dying and so she couldn't walk for over a year and they would slowly the nerves would slowly grow back uh, but very as you know with, with nerves, it's very, very, very slow, and when they're growing, they're firing. So that it's it's a, uh, growth is good, but the consequence of that is that there's constant pain with the growth of the nerves. Mm, yes. So so she was uh, it was just a terrible ordeal, uh, and I was seeing that and observing how she was dealing with the suffering. You know how what would be her response, and her response was was incredibly inspiring to me. So this is now the connection. Uh, it was a response of patience, of, of perseverance, but also of, uh, of compassion and care for me and for other people, not just becoming self-centered and, and, and kind of uh, self-absorbed with her, her own difficulties. So when that happened uh, in high school, that was one of the major uh, impacts in my life for changing my own orientation and how I see the world and also had lots of religious cons- consequences too. Excellent. So, you know, and when we're elevated, something that I'm also thinking about is when we get elevated by something, whether it's you being inspired by your mom or reading a book about a guy like Paul Farmer, we can try really, really, really hard to become better. But as you've you know described a few minutes ago, it's really hard to be a truly virtuous person. Like you said, it's almost like impossibly unattainable. Um, mm-hmm. So even if we try to become better, like I feel like habit forming is so difficult in life. And even if we try to become better, we will over time tend to fall back into like a more normal routine. So it's like that incremental improvement. And then we take one step forward and then two steps back. So I like the line in the book where you said the point is not to become Paul Farmer to become it's to become more like Paul Farmer or whoever your example or mm-hmm. elevator mm-hmm. is. So in other words, to be more intentional and in helping the poorest people in the world, whatever that might look like. And so Paul Farmer helps the poorest people in the world. He helps some of the most unlucky people in the world. And your last part that you write about where you say whatever it might look like, I feel like that line could mean almost anything. Mm-hmm. Right. Could that line? So we have like obviously like national elections coming up, and these types of things with how we treat unlucky people is always a national issue in our country. So if somebody's feeling like like super overwhelmed with life and they can't you know do tons and tons of stuff to help super unlucky people, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. could becoming slightly more virtuous be as simple as voting for people in office in our country who vow to help? the unluckiest people in the world instead of voting for people who vilify the unluckiest people in the world? Like, would that be a step in the right direction for becoming a little bit more virtuous? Great, great, great. Yeah. So, so I, uh, entirely agree with the, the background point here, first of all, that, uh, becoming fully virtuous is really, really hard. And uh, as I said earlier, probably unattainable. And so we shouldn't set that up as the goal. We should set up the goal as making incremental progress Mm -hmm. and, also, I really like the point that it's not going to be linear progress, uh, or re- at least rarely is linear progress. Not not in my life, that's for sure. Uh, right? Yeah. So so it's going to be jagged, uh, and sometimes there's going to be one step forward and two steps back, and sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. Uh, so that, that I think we should just just acknowledge that reality. Uh, 
that it that I also like your point that it needn't be you know these these huge acts of kindness or compassion. And for some people, that's just not realistic. There, there's there's so many other balls to juggle that you can't take on one more big thing. So we could find smaller uh, acts of kindness uh, to maybe enrich our life in this way. You gave one example uh, that seems to me uh, 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 very uh, uh, kind of, uh, I would say, uncontroversial. You know, I, absolutely. Um, it, it's an example of moral virtue. It's an example of civic virtue also. Uh, so voting in such a way that um, you hope the uh, people who come into leadership will do things which are promoting character and promoting morality and, and, and good, good, uh, good actions in the world. My only uh, kind of amendment to that would be, well, that's, you know, that's one thing, but I don't think we would want to just leave it at that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we want to maybe find a few other things. Maybe it's, uh, you know, a letter writing campaign. Um, maybe it's trying to see if you can uh, volunteer a little bit on Saturday morning. Uh, maybe it's uh, raising a little money online for a cause. Um, so I would just uh, just encourage a little bit uh, more to go around the voting. Excellent. Okay. So, you know, um, have you ever seen the TV show The Good Place, that comedy? I have. I've, I've seen a, 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 most of season one. I'm, I'm still uh, trying to catch up. I'm behind on it. Okay. So whenever I knew that I was going to talk to you, a philosophy professor who cares about character, the the character Cheedy from The Good Place came to mind. And he's a character who is like really obsessed with deliberating how to be good. And he's so obsessed with it that he drives everybody away. And I'm not <laughs> saying that you do this at all. I'm just, I just wanted to know that. I hope I, not. I it was, no, I thought it was a funny example. So I'm curious a little bit about your life outside the academy because mm -hmm. as a professor who cares about human virtue, character, behavior, motivation, I'm curious how, when you describe these concepts and explain how hard it is to be a good person to people who are outside the philosophy profession, mm -hmm. how do you feel like these points are received by people in like everyday society? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And this is something I've I got some concrete evidence about. Because oh, good. I've been, well, in a sense that I've been speaking to a lot more non-academic audiences than I ever have in the past. Excellent. So, you know, my profession... Uh, up until I wrote this book, it would always be at, at a what we call the American Philosophical Association conference or other professional organizations like that. But this, you know, one of the the byproducts, not not the goals distinction we had earlier, that one of the byproducts of writing the book has been this opportunity to engage in a, in a speaking uh, uh, venues with a larger audience. So my I think it really depends on how the message is delivered. If it's delivered in a in a way that's very judgmental uh that's saying you know here's all these reasons why you're not a very good person and i'm standing up here as a know-it-all <laughs> and you know implicitly also i've got it i've got it all figured out and i've got a great character and look at you all you know you know you scum of the earth kind of thing well then uh, obviously that's uh, I'll never have a, a, another audience again uh, right yeah and it's not but it's not true either it's it, it's um Here's here's what how I try to to to, to convey the ideas instead. Um, look, uh, I've been reading this research in psychology. I want to share with you some of the findings. Uh, these some of these findings are alarming and startling and surprising and things I never would have expected before. How in certain situations we under pressure from authorities we would kill innocent people. In other situations, in a group context, we wouldn't help someone who is screaming in pain. In other situations, uh, when we have an opportunity to cheat, we would cheat with abandon. So learning about this research, I'm, pre I'm presenting it in a kind of as neutral and objective way as I can. And it has the backing of you know, scientific, careful study. And then I add to that, well, what do we make of this? You know, What are we supposed to do with these ideas? If, if we take these findings as legitimate. Well, it seems to say that all of us, myself included, I always want to put myself in, in, in the group, uh, fall short of being a virtuous person. Well, then I say, you know, isn't it important to be a virtuous person? And I can I go over some, some reasons why virtue matters and why it's 
you know, being good is a good thing. And I find there that you know, people tend to nod their heads and say, yeah, I, I care about honesty. I care about compassion. I care about justice. These are important things to me. They're also important things when I'm raising my children. I want my children to be like that. So let's think together, given that we f tend to fall short, there's a character gap. Let's think together about ways in which we can try to improve. And I, at least from my perspective, that seems to draw the audience in as opposed to uh, alienating people. Well, and I love how you don't spare yourself in the book. You know, like um, in your acknowledgement section, you have a quote that says, what I say in this book about the character gap is true first and foremost about me. And I really admire that a lot that you put that in there because you don't have to. So have you done any like hard looks at yourself um, throughout this process of writing this book as well? Uh, I have, although probably again, my own theory would say I need to do more. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'm probably not doing nearly enough as I should be. Uh, one thing I'm constantly d trying to do is when I read these studies that show surprising features of our character, then I think, well, what would that imply for me? So if I were in a group context and an emergency has happened, so someone's passed out in the aisle at Walmart and no one's helping uh, and people are just going about their business shopping and so forth, what would I do? And I initially, I think I would help, but maybe I wouldn't. Maybe because this research is so compelling, maybe I would hold back. Okay, then I, I need to think a little bit more I need to overcome that tendency. I need, I need to be, be examining myself so that if I were in an emergency context, I would step up to the plate and actually help as opposed to just thinking that I would. Uh, so so that's, that's a little bit of initial thought, but it's really um, two areas in my life I think have really uh, been clarified, and I'm sure there are lots more, but in my mind uh, uh, as really needing a lot of help. One is patience. Um, it's also helped by the fact that I have three small children. Oh yeah. Uh, so I, I need, I really needed to, uh, work on my patience. That's an area of, uh, definitely uh, lack of virtue and then, um, pride. Uh, so the, the, what traditionally in the West was, uh, was thought to be the worst vice of all, uh, you know, it, it, it and counterbalanced by humility. So, you know, uh, I want to constantly try to, make sure this is not about me and self aggrandizement and self promotion. And I'm doing this for the right reasons. Uh, and, and, and so forth. Do you ever beat yourself up knowing how, like how much more you can do to be a virtuous person, but aren't yet doing? Uh, sometimes. Yes. Uh, especially when I read these, these stories of exemplars. Uh, and I think, well, I'm so, I so fall short of someone like Paul Farmer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could be doing so much more. Or, you know, another example I use in the book is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, wow, he was such a man of integrity and honesty, and look how he cared about, uh, you know, never cheating people and and stealing from people. And look how far I fall short as well. Uh, you know, there's there there's that I don't beat myself up. Maybe I should more. I don't know. But uh, I don't think it's very healthy to do it too much, though. Yeah. Uh, and I also uh, think there's there's something called grace um, that uh, that applies to that. It, if it was just a matter of legalism where I'm always falling short and that's a yet another kind of stain on my moral transcript or on my record and I'm I'm just accumulating so many of these stains, uh, that would be discouraging after a while. But I also think there's something called grace that can uh, can help with that. Nice. So you've brought up religion a little bit throughout this conversation. You said it a couple times, but you also close the book with a like the religious approaches to living a virtuous life. And you do a really good job of stating the objectivity and how you're not trying to like convince anybody of anything in particular. But I feel like, so this show is about religion, so I feel comfortable asking you about this. Mm -hmm. um, a lot could be read into the fact that you ended the book on Christianity and didn't write a formal conclusion chapter. Like, the Christianity chapter is essentially your conclusion. Why right. did you uh, choose to close the book with religion instead of, like, a more formal conclusion chapter? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so there's, there's one question, why did I do Christianity uh, as opposed to other religions? And then there's another question, why... Uh, not have the, the, the formal ending. 
I didn't have the formal ending just because I don't like formal endings. So I okay. don't have I don't have a very very compelling answer there. I just I find that formal endings, whether they do, they just tend to summarize everything that happened in the book again. And so I'm reading w- once again what I've already read. Gotcha. And I find it just kind of repetitive. So I I didn't know what else I would do. So I just didn't do one. Um, the question about Christianity in particular, and or I, maybe just like why why I have a chapter on religion, and and then why Christianity in particular. Uh, I really um, thought, boy, the, the, most people throughout history have been religious, or at least they they say they're subscribed to religion, and the m- major world religions are filled with teachings about character. Mm-hmm. Uh, these religions value character. They want to promote character, maybe not always in exactly the same way, but they think it's really important. Some of, some of religions say it's the most important thing, the most central thing. So it would be a shame to just, you know, put all that to one side and not at least draw on or explore a little bit in, in a chapter. And then I had the, 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 the next thought, which was, you know, methodologically or strategically, how am I going to do this? Am I going to want to have like three pages on Confucianism and three pages on Judaism and three pages on Hinduism? Well, I could do that, but that would be really superficial. And I, I just think it would be it would just not even get anywhere uh, and almost be disrespectful to the religions which have such uh, rich teachings to offer. Yeah, for sure. So then I, I chose uh, one religion, and but I you know, Christianity, one which I'm, I'm familiar with. I think readers uh, are probably going to be more familiar with this on average than, than the other ones I could have chosen. But I make the point again and again that uh, this is just one example. Other religions have lots to offer as far as character is concerned. And you don't even have to be religious in the first place in order to have a good character. There can be, and there are, virtuous people who are completely secular. Gotcha. So, you know, but you did include some really interesting details in the book that I've never seen before with regards to religion, and especially the correlation studies of religion on young people. And you talk about, like, you know, if people have a, like a religious affiliation, there are rates of smoking, drugs, speeding tickets, arrest rates, skipping school, and more. It's it was pretty fascinating because, um, you know, I, I had never seen those statistics. Have you? What are some of the biggest takeaways after skimming and reading the hundreds of studies that discuss these correlations? Like, what have you um, taken away from those readings? Yeah. So in that last chapter, I I had this section on empirical evidence. Uh, because this, the chapter is on does religion and Christianity in particular have something to contribute to good moral behavior and ultimately to good character. So I want to suggest some ways in which it seems like it could, and then also investigate the empirical data since I'm so big on, on empirical data. Now, the data I look at is data from sociology, psychology, economics, and other related fields is data that correlates measures of religiosity. So things like how often do you pray a day in a given day Mm -hmm. or how frequently do you attend a religious service in a month? So different measures of religiosity correlated with, well, you know, things that are important like, um, how uh, much do you donate to charity or how many hours do you volunteer to, to, uh, to help others? Or as you said, some of the other ones, smoking, education, health, uh, criminal behavior, and the like. So looking at, you see, you asked me about you know, painting a broad picture, looking at the studies. In general, the studies tend to find a correlation between the religiosity and what I would say are, are good things. So the, the more religiosity goes up, the more the good things go up. So for example, uh, more religiosity goes up, more uh, volunteering is, is done or more, a uh, greater amount of money is donated to charity, whether it's a secular charity or a religious charity. But, uh, last, uh, thought here, uh, two kind of caveats we need to keep in mind. Um, first of all, uh, this is just correlational. Yeah. I was just thinking right? that. <laughs> yep. So, so we all know that the, the, the line correlation is not causation. So it doesn't mean just because there's a correlation that it's that the religious stuff is causing the good stuff. Uh, it could be that the other way around, uh, or I think what's probably this is speculation though is probably going on is that it's mutual. There's there's causation going in both directions. Uh, so that's one caveat, and then the other caveat is 
this doesn't automatically translate to good character either because we don't know the motivation. So we've stressed so many times the motivation matters too. And these studies are not are just behavioral studies. They're getting at the outward behavior, but they're not telling us much about what the underlying motivation was for doing the good things. So we should keep those things in mind. I'm curious as well about some of your, you mentioned some Eastern and Asian traditions in the book, just a tiny little bit. If you were going to uh, write more on this from like Eastern Asian and Asian traditions and other Abrahamic religions, are there some suggested readings that you would encourage listeners to go see if they want to learn about virtue and character in other religions as well? I'd have to give that some more thought as far as, uh, contemporary writings uh i i mean in my own case the first place i would go would be the ancient confucian tradition uh in terms of primary writing so his, the historical writings uh so it's well known that confucius for example in his intellects gives us a picture of morality that's very much uh sympathetic to what we've been talking about today so it's it's very much a character infused picture of morality that emphasizing the importance of virtue and becoming a virtuous person and what that would look like and the and it's stressing the need to have a society that facilitates virtue and what that would look like so a number of scholars recently have been drawing connections between confucius's work and say plato and aristotle in their picture of virtue and noting how strikingly similar they are so that would be one place i would go but as far as uh, thinking about who's writing on this topic in a contemporary context, I might have to get back to you on that one. You know, I, I actually have my bookshelf right next to me, and I pulled out one of my copies of the Analects of Confucius. I have several different translations, but I opened it to a totally random page. And, it, <laughs> and, and it, like on seriously, the first page I opened, this is not even a joke, it says, The master said, A man of virtue is dignified and self-respecting, but not contentious. He gets along well with others, but never joins a clique to pursue material gains. So right there, there you, yeah, there you, 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 have, you have the virtue, you have the behavior, and you have the yep. motivation all there on a random wow. page. Wow, <laughs> that, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, Dr. Christian Miller, I'm really thrilled to talk to you about this book, The Character Gap, How Good Are We? Um, do you have any like words of encouragement on character that you would like to leave the audience with as we go away? Sure. Uh, so my, my first uh, thought here is that uh, it, character really matters. It's important. I think we most listeners are going to believe that. The encouraging thing is that our character is malleable. So it'd be really discouraging if we were stuck in the mud. If this is what we have now, it's kind of genetically and hardwired into us and we can't do anything about it. But there's overwhelming evidence that that's not the case. That character can move gradually over time in different directions. So the first point of encouragement would be, uh, you know, we can make changes and we can make progress. The, the second point would be that it doesn't have to be solitary or left up to our own devices. Uh, if you're, you know, if the listener happens to be religious, there's a kind of whole religious context that would come into play here, thinking about how the divine might play a role in helping shape character. But there's also just the, the human social element too. There's looking to friends, family, uh, exemplars, heroes, saints, and so forth, uh, for help, for, uh, for their example, uh, for their role model, for their guidance and wisdom, for their advice and recommendations, and maybe even for their correction. So I would uh, encourage people to say, think, uh, summing it up here, uh, character can change, and it doesn't have to be left to our own devices. We can look to others to help us in that process. You have a brand new piece out that you just put out on character.org on that exact topic about the malleable character, right? That's right. Yes. Where can people uh, find that? Uh, that particular article is just, if you just go to uh, character.org and then I don't know how to find it from the main page, but if you just went into Google and typed character.org and Christian Miller, you would, you would get it that way. Excellent. Um, I know that you're active online as well. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch or follow your work? Great. Um, so probably the easiest thing is uh, uh, following me on Facebook or Twitter at Character Gap, one word, at Character Gap. Uh, but 
my the book is easily available at all the usual places like Amazon. It's you know a big got a big discount going on right now at Amazon, uh, and, and I'm happy to email with anyone as well. So my my email address is millerc at wfu.edu, and uh, anyone who has questions or interested in pursuing these topics in more detail, feel free to email me. I will put a link to the book in the show notes. So any listener out there, uh, just look in the show notes and you can click that link and you can go right to the book. Well, Dr. Christian Miller, this has been a real pleasure. I am super grateful to you for spending some time with me today on your summer break from teaching. And uh, I look forward to following more of your work in the future. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening.